Welcome back to Peking University MOOC Bioinformatics Introduction and Methods. I am Ge Gao from the Center of Bioinformatics, Peking University. In the next few months, I will teach this MOOC with my colleague, Dr. Li Pingwei. Now, let's start our second week's topic, Sequence Alignment. First, let's review some basic concepts. Bioinformatics as a young interdisciplinary field has enjoyed rapid development in the past 20 years. Numerous handy software tools and databases have been developed and made available on the Internet for the biological research community. According to the statistics on the Canadian website, bioinformatics.ca, as of July 2013, there have been over 1,400 online bioinformatics tools freely available to bi biologists. Most of them have nice and friendly user interfaces and detailed tutorials. Users could access them easily via web browsers and analyze their data with only a few clicks. So why do we need to a course that teach teaches principles and methods rather than just usage of tools. There have been many useful online tools. The reason is simple. Computers are not biologists. They cannot understand the biological problems you want to solve. These tools are just programs that operate on input data by predefined pipelines that were all designed under certain assumptions. If you input data and all the problem you want to solve are not consistent with these assumptions, mistakes would occur. This is a news piece published in 2006 in Science Magazine. Two data columns were mistakenly swapped in a computer program, leading to the retraction of five papers, including three in Science, one in PNAS, and one in Journal of Molecular Biology. This was very sad, but maybe they used an obscure software. So it was difficult to catch the mistake. Maybe it would be safe to use popular software that, were, that are well validated. This is another news in the genome biology some time ago reporting another case. The author of the problem, problematic paper in this case used the BLAST one of the most widely used tools in bioinformatics, which we will talk about next week, and discovered adenocyclases in plants. This discovery was published in Nature, but retracted one year later due to incorrect conclusions drawn from bad analyses. Therefore, it is dangerous to use the tools blindly without a solid understanding of the assumptions and principles. We want to teach you in this MOOC not only the popular bioinformatic tools but also the underlying principles and ideas so that you can take advantage of these powerful tools better while avoiding possible pitfalls or as the Siemens commercial says, know the principle, use the power, this is how. You can use the power better only if you know the principle. We will introduce each method from the following aspects. First of all, the biology. What is the biological problems this method tries to address? Why do we need this method? Secondly, the data. What input data and parameters are needed to run this method? The third part, modeling, will tell you how the biological problems can be formulated into a computational problem. Last but not least, we will discuss the algorithm itself, its performance and its constraints and limitations. Now, let's look at the problem of sequence alignment. Let's first look at the biological question behind sequence alignment, that is, how similar are two genes or proteins? Can we tell it by comparing their sequences of nucleotides or amino acids? 
This simple looking idea is actually very useful in biological researchers. Why? This is pairwise sequence alignment, the alignment between two sequences. There are several tools to choose from. We will choose the first one. Let's click it. OK, now we can see this page. It looks simple enough. The tip tells us to fill with two protein sequences. Let's fill in the blanks with sequences of human hemoglobin subunit alpha and subunit beta. OK, this is how it looks after we filled in the blanks. Please note that the greater than sign in the first line is followed by the name of the sequence. For example, the name for the alpha subunit is HBA human. The name for the beta unit is HBB human. Starting from the second line, we have the protein sequences made up by 20 amino acids. Simple enough. Let's just ignore step 2 for now because it says that the default settings will fulfill the needs of most users. Now, let's just press the Submit button. Now, the result is here. Let's take a look. The results are a little complex, so we will check them one by one. Let's look at the bottom half first. You can see that in addition to the two input sequences, there is an extra line below them that describes the alignment itself, and it's called a markup line or alignment string. Let's take a closer look at this extra line. This markup line consists mainly of vertical bars, colons, dots, and white spaces. It is easy to see that the vertical bars represent alignments of the same residues, such as the M to M and V to V alignments. What about the colons and dots? You can find out immediately that they cannot denote alignments of the same residues because they are not vertical bars. These residues are different too. Let's take a look at the first column for the S and the T. They denote a substitution from S to T. The columns and dots are used to denote the level of similarity between two aligned residues that are not identical. The columns denote aligned residues that are similar, whereas the dots denote those that are not that similar. Specifically, the similarity between a pair of amino acids is evaluated using the substitution matrix, which here in this case is Blossom 62 matrix at the upper right corner. For example, the score of substituting S with T in the substitution matrix in Blossom 62 is 1. So you can see a colon here. The score of substituting A with E is minus 1, which is less than 0, so a dot was used. That is how the colons and dots are used. Not difficult, right? Let's look at the results more carefully. You can see that all the substitution of S with T and all of the substitution of T with S are denoted by columns. In fact, the substitution matrix, matrix is symmetric with respect to the diagonal. In other words, the substitution of S with T and the substitution of T with S will have the same score. The direction of substitution does, doesn't matter. It is a symmetric matrix. You can also see that all the substitution for S have the same score, which means that the substitution scores are related and only related to the two residues involved. The substitution matrix is context-free. You can see that the first substitution of T with S is preceded by K, while the second is preceded by L. Their scores, however, are the same, and both have a colon displayed in the markup line. In fact, the substitution score of a pair of aligned residues is independent of other pairs of residues. 
These seemingly trivial features are in fact very important, as we will see later. Finally, let's look at the gaps. From the view of evolution, gaps denote insertions and or deletions of dynamic fragments during the course of evolution, often called indels. An insertion in one sequence can be regarded as a deletion in, uh, in the other sequence. Indels often have some effects on the function of sequences, so gaps in an aligned alignment usually receive negative scores, called the gap penalty. Since an event of insertion or deletion often involves multiple residues, a gap often has a length of more than one residue. This is different from substitutions. Gap penalty is often implemented as a linear combination of gap opening penalty and gap extending penalty, which were usually given different penalty scores. Let's take the penalty score for the second gap as an example. As suggested by the formula at the lower right corner, opening a new gap will receive a penalty score of 10. Ext extending it will receive a penalty score of 0 0.5. So the total penalty score is 10.5. As for the last gap, its length is 5. So the penalty score is 10 plus 0 0.5 times 4, which equals 12. Finally, subtracting the sum of gap penalties from the sum of substitution scores will give you the final scores, 292.5, as shown in the result marked by a red line. Some students might wonder why there is a score of 0 0.5. The reason is that it is extending a gap rather than opening a new gap. We have used this example to illustrate some basic ideas involved in the most simple pairwise alignment. Here are some summary questions. They are not assignments, but you are encouraged to think about them and discuss your answers and ideas in the online forum. That's all for Unit 1. In Unit 2, we will illustrate how to use algorithms to do such sequence alignment. Thank you. See you at the next unit.